<laughs> Today we have Joel Kaminsky and Brendan White presenting Floating Island Technology, Water Ecology Enhancement Techniques. Their advisor is Dr. Fry Singer, and please hold all your questions to the end and give them your undivided attention. Thank you. So thanks everyone for coming out. Um, as he said, floating island technology and water ecology enhancement techniques. My name is Brendan White. And I'm Joel Kaminsky. So let's dive right into what our main issue that we're focusing on these days. And in America and the world, we're losing a lot of our wetlands every year. Um, 42% of the wetlands since 1780s in America have been lost. Uh, that is possibly due to overpopulation because they're draining it from farmland and we need to feed people. So you got to drain the water, get the good fertilizer, um, soil from the swamps and all that stuff. And in the global world, we're losing 50% since the early 1900s based on a comp compilation of about 200 reports. And over here you'll see a graph from 1950s to 1990s on the top is all intertidal wetlands and on the bottom is estuary and vegetated wetlands. Um, and it shows a sharp decline from 1950s to the 1980s, but as you see it plateaus off in both. Now that's not reason to stop and slow down the fight to protect our wetlands, but it's most likely the cause of EPA getting really involved with protecting wetlands in America. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but this is for America. Um, and so we're about to introduce a technology that could possibly bring us back to where we used to be in 1950s with our wetland service area and growth. And so what is a floating treatment wetland? Well, here we have a picture from Floating Islands West, um, a company that I interned for over the summer last year in Montana. And they actually create this material here that we'll pass around real quick. And it is basically constructed of a s one square foot of that is three recyclable water bottles. And so it creates a living filter that allows for microbes and uh, plant roots to penetrate and work together in symbiotic relationships to uptake nutrients, uh, BOD in the water, uh, suspended solids, um, any type of water pollution that you could think that you might need to clarify from the water or purify uh, to improve the ecosystem growth to prevent things like toxic algae blooms that would eventually kill the ecosystem's basic layers um, and lose its viability as a living environment. So it's like a natural wetland because it utilizes the concentrated wetland effect, which basically has two key components, maximum surface area and circulation. And the founder of Floating Islands International same ones that created this picture, actually created that, it's called a biohaven matrix, and he found from biomimicry of noticing natural floating islands that the ratio of surface area circulation is as such in the material, and created himself to basically create artificial wetland seeds. That you can plant this in any water body, and it will actually end up acting as a, like I said, a living filter, and create a whole new wetland that's literally floating. I actually stood on one of these in Montana and got to edge some invasive species off and it didn't budge at all. It's actually really cool. Um, but how can this technology actually benefit its stakeholders? So we believe that a lot of the meat industry has water quality issues, especially with their uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. You know, we've seen a lot of pictures on the internet, people environmentalists get really worried about these heavily nutrified, uh, eutrophied lakes of just kind of like waste, animal waste material seeping into bodies of water that other people might come in contact with or down the line hurt farms and stuff like that. Um, you could plant some of these wetlands in there and it could possibly clean that environment because I saw that as well in Montana where they had a sewage waste lagoon that was just nasty. It was algae ridden and basically the water looked brown and yellow and green in some places. But in 15 years when I was there, uh, it turned into a beautiful productive ecosystem that you could cast a rod in, in 30 seconds you'd have a fish every time. It's really amazing. So taking what we learned, we decided to do a field test. And so this image right here, these are our two islands that we had set up with cattails and sweet, sweet grass and a bunch of other yellow iris, and et cetera. And uh, we decided this part of the Silver Lake because we noticed that all of the other edges had cattails and everything all around it except for this very algae uh, infested part and back what you don't see is a, a rock ledge all the way across so what we were kind of hoping with this is that kind of our purpose was to clean this lake uh, to remediate the buffer um, on this side of the shore and hopefully it would grow into it 
uh, into the actual islands themselves and create a, a way for the actual edge of the lake to uh, uptake the nutrients. This, we had a couple mistakes, and one of the things was that Silver Lake is way, way too big. Um, there's a recommended, uh, Floating Island International recommends about a one to five ratio uh, island to, to lake, and what we found that we were using was a one to 2,000, which is not, <laughs> not very good. Um, and another thing, on October 9th, uh, we found that Hurricane Matthew came by 75 mile an hour winds and capsized them, so yeah. just completely destroyed it. And that's, those are those pictures over on the side of there. Um, and that was due to tall standing cattails that we were using and the wind speeds, as well as improper anchoring. We were anchoring with just tether straight to the shoreline, and I, I didn't feel that that was, that was beneficial for, for keeping it in line. Um, so what we learned was that uh, in order for us to be able to do this, we'd have to have a smaller body of water. We'd have to be able to control different elements like wind speed and um, uh, low-lying plants that would be be used in our in our islands. Right, and of course we had permits from um, the from Department Brad of Fink. and Inlet Fisheries. Mm -hmm. Brad Fink helped us to get permits for putting these islands in there. Mm -hmm. So we went to a lab setup. So this is the lab setup that we had right here. The initial it was in Tupperware containers, both the Biohaven matrix compared against a clay aggregate uh, like a standard hydroponic. So the purpose of this was to tell whether the standard hydroponic or the clay matrix or the uh, biohaven matrix would uptake more total nitrogen uh, using romaine lettuce in a 23-day period. And so what we found was that the resolution initially was way too big. We were using a lake. We decided to use uh, five-gallon tanks, still too big. Kyle Snow helped us to find, uh, find out that our resolution needed to be higher. So we decided to go with one liter uh, Tupperware containers. And, <clears throat> and uh, so our steps are simple. We took uh, starting germinating with uh, rockwool cubes and we put three seeds in each in water uh, every day for a week. And then we took these transplanted seeds or transplanted uh, rockwool cubes and put them into uh, either a cut out section of that biohaven material, cut the size of the square, or a um, <coughs> clay aggregate, kind of like your standard hydroponic. The reason why we decided this is our standard for hydroponic was partly due to a recommendation from fifth season uh, hydroponic grow shop in, uh, in uh, Charlottesville, and they recommended this because of its high surface area, and we found this through other research that this is, this is true. And so what we did was we had to create a nutrient solution to make sure that it would be the same throughout all of the initial tests. And we took our plant food, our uh, nutrient, and we added it to water, and we had to fix the pH to about a 5.5. And so in sampling, we sampled the very first day and the very last day, 23 day that we took out. And the reason why is because we weren't so much concerned about the progression of the um, the uptake, we were just concerned about the very initial value, making sure that they were the same, and the last value to see whether they were the same or different. And then after that, we did a, a total nitrogen test um, in order to find the standards for, so what happens is, is, you, is you take standards for a level of concentration that you know, and then you graph it against a, a line and then you take what you know from those standards and you find what your concentration from the absorbance using a spectro spectrometer um, mixing with a couple different chemicals to find what your, you predict your uh, diluted and undiluted concentrations are. Yeah. And so on the left is our final, what we found to be our final setup for the transfer to the nutrient solution and on the right is our germinating setup. And so here's just kind of a quick picture of some of the incubators we're looking at. Spectrometer's right here, but we kind of got cut off a little bit there. Um, but we can uh, go right into a little bit about the standard curve that Brendan was talking about. So this is a graph of our absorption, the thing we read from the spectrometer. And basically a spectrometer just shoots light particles and see how much the concentration is based on the absorbance of another sensor after the beam of light shot through. And so here, it allows you a lot of freedom to plot a curve that you can actually measure based on your own data. And so, uh, 
we started with a concentration of 150 parts per million total nitrogen. Uh, that was known to us. We calculated for that, and I'll show you that in a second. But the spectrometer had a limit of 25 parts per million that it could read effectively. And so we didn't want to burn that out or cause any problems. So Kyle Snow helped us to create dilutions of 0, 1, 5, 10, and 25 parts per million that we could then take the slope and find each of those orange little dots, which are our samples, go from the absorbents and multiply it. You do a little math with the slope of 0 0.0196 and find our diluted concentration. And then from there, we used a simple dilution formula. That's concentration one, or the starting concentration, times volume, uh, or the initial volume, equals the second concentration, or the ending concentration, and the ending volume. Uh, and there you can see our 150 parts per million total nitrogen, and we were solving for uh, the first volume, well, the volume of our samples to add to a test tube that the spectrometer would then read through. And that volume needed to be two milliliters, as you see there. And so our initial volume to add from the sample was 0.133 milliliters. But we didn't have a pipette at that resolution. So Costner helped us to find one for 0.135, as you see there. And we found a standard that we we're going to drop down to of 10.125 parts per million total nitrogen. Can you go back for a second, Brendan? And that's why you see all these orange dots around 10 and a little lower. Because we, we chose 10, so we dropped everything down equally so that everything would stay in the same so we could then re undilute it with some math. And so drop down, this would be around our like 150 parts per million. And then we basically just did that formula in reverse to then go from our diluted concentrations from 0 to 25 to our <coughs> undiluted concentrations, which are in the next slide. So here are our main results. And on the left side, you can see our matrix, our bio-hidden matrix. And on the right side is our clay aggregate hydroponics. And so uh, two things I'd really like you to take from this graph is the, com the comparison from day one uh, matrix to the clay aggregate hydroponics. And these error bars here, you can see that they're basically on the same level, that the bars kind of are inside the same error bars. And that statistically significant shows that the, the means are the same. And these are also averaged, uh, each six. Uh, and then here, for day 23, you can obviously see that the columns are very different and that the error bars are outside of itself. It's kind of hard to see this one, but it's a very close call. But we actually did find that they are different. And we did some statistical calculations here, doing a two-tailed difference of the mean t-test. Because our sample size is so low, we were able to do a t-test. And we found up top was our day one matrix comparison to the hydroponic clay aggregate. And so we use a significance level of 0 0.01, which is used in most scientific research to make sure your data is really saying what it's saying. Uh, and we found here that our p-value equaled 0.82, which was less than I mean, our significance value was less than our p-value, proving that we must accept the null hypothesis, meaning that both the means are equal. And this is very important because if we didn't have equal means in the very beginning, that means that our data is offset. We concentrated the batches differently between the matrix and the hydroponics, and that would cause some incongruence in our data, and we'd have to do some crazy math to figure that stuff out, <laughs> or redo it all. We didn't want to do that because we were running low on time. <laughs> But uh, on the bottom, we see our day 23 comparison of matrix to the hydroponic. And we found our p-value to be much lower, which is very good, 0 0.0002. And that is less than the significance level. So we have to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative, meaning that both means are different. So taking what we learned from the statistical significance of our two-tailed t-test, uh, we, we looked at um, we looked at the data and we, it showed that there was an uptake in the 23rd day from the <coughs> matrix. So the matrix was uptaking nutrient. Um, we kind of, su it suggests that the uh, plant's interaction, microbial interaction, and the algae itself is what is uptaking the nutrients. But what our test showed, and from, from different uh, determining factors, was that the actual material itself was what was causing it because of the fact that there, if you can even see in this picture, there's no root growth past the, uh, the cube. There was no root growth into the actual medium itself. So that although that is true, it would happen throughout all of the experiment. So this means that 
it's still just statistically statistically valid. So our medium, the actual matrix, was what the structure and the shape of it was what was uptaking the nutrients in some way. Um, and so this is because of its surface area and porosity. You can even see here. Um, and so what this shows is what we want to want you to know is that the shape of th this one here, the matrix, biohaven matrix, is actually the size of the top almost. So there wasn't as much light getting into the actual nutrient solution itself, but there was still more uptake of nutrients as compared to this clay aggregate where we found observably that there was more light being penetrated into the actual aggregate, um, but less nitrogen uptake. And then on the bottom here, you can see that on the left is a lack of suspended solids in the biohaven matrix after we took it out. And on the right here, you can see a lot of uh, suspended solids inside of the clay aggregate. Mm -hmm. So what we kind of think this means is that the actual surface area and the structure of this is allowing for the uh, algae to kind of get in there and the microbial interactions are uh, working within that material, kind of creating a habitat for it, as opposed to this clay aggregate where there's not as much surface area, there's not as much uh, reflectivity, because this is plastic made from recycled bottles, um, that it would not uh, uptake as much nutrient, have a great habitat for those mi microbial interactions. Yeah, and before you switch real quick, you can really see, here in the hydroponics, you can kind of see just like a mess of algae all over it. But over here you see a thin line and it looks like it kind of just absorbed straight from the surface of the water into the matrix and as Brendan said it just spread in there possibly created more growth because it had more places to grow on mm -hmm. and so with this project we did run out of time a lot because we we started early but our field tests kind of got demolished and we were really hoping that that would work out but we saw it as a blessing in disguise but we would love to see some more future research being done in this field by researchers and students alike and possibly passing down this project to other people because the material is there to be used. So at first we would love for somebody to, or us, whatever, <coughs> to determine if the nutrient removal was due to the plant or the algae itself. And something we looked in back in hindsight was like, wow, we forgot to weigh the mass of the rockwool cubes before we even started germination. And then at the end of the mm -hmm. trial, after the lettuce had grown, because then we could have figured out the biomass and the concentration of nitrogen that had been uptaken based on that mass. And we could figure out how much nutrient and less actually taken up versus the algae. Then we could actually make a determining result. That would be a really cool experiment. It's basically the same thing, but with one extra step. Number two, to determine with more accuracy if the material is actually to blame rather than just the circumstances itself. Um, and this would probably just be done with focusing on just trying to really cultivate and grow algae without using lettuce. So maybe, uh, just the same exact setup with uh, that same material, but also, as Brennan said earlier, light penetration was different between the two types of setups by a hidden matrix and a hydroponic clay, because a hydroponic clay had like a circular basket that the clay pellet sat in and then sat in the water. But then our matrix, we cut into squares just because it was simple at the time and the material was really hard to cut by hand. Uh, but the light penetration was less into that. Um, so if we equalize that surface area horizontally, then we think that would be a little more statistically significant. Also three, a successful field test in a body of water would be great to see. And, uh, Smaller body of water with yeah. bigger islands. Yeah, so try to get that ratio of one to five that Floating Islands International actually represents um, or recommends. Um, and the last thing is just to create an aquaponic system from the matrix. I worked out in Montana, as I kind of mentioned earlier, for an internship over last summer. And it was a really amazing experience. I was able to work with his pond that he turned from a sewage lagoon into a beautiful paradise. And all of his docks were floating islands. And he was basically growing fish as his nutrient removal vehicle. So he loved fishing, loved fly fishing, taught me a little bit. He was kind of a bad teacher because he yelled at me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was a really effective way to bring people closer to nature, get involved with their food process uh, <coughs> by harvesting those fish. And like I said, it was every 30 seconds so you'd catch a fish. It was really amazing to see. And all of his docks, all the structures were made of this material and actually showed that 
the buoyancy would increase over time as more surface area was added because of the microbes creating atmospheric like gas bubbles inside the biofilm which is just microbes in the residue. And one thing that we kind of noticed when we went, actually went out to the lake itself, we actually asked a couple of fishermen who were out there, we were like, hey, you, you catch anything? They're like, nah, didn't catch anything. So that would be something that, you know, in our local communities, if we created buffer zones for, for lakes to be able to replenish, you know, make it healthier, yeah. make it so that fishers could have a, a nicer time spending yeah. their days out there. Yeah, living docks are, are a way to increase the nutrient uh, ecosystem efficiency or cycling efficiency of nutrients. And uh, my parents just got a house down Smith Mountain Lake and I noticed all the banks are kind of eroding horribly. And this material can be used very well to stabilize those banks because cattails will grow right into that soil and kind of pull everything together and create a beautiful bank line. And there's actually a community program actually stopping people from building some docks because of the environmental issues with the eroding banks. Mm -hmm. And if you could build floating docks, you wouldn't have to be and as it invasive erode away. and it would support the ecosystem much better. And I actually hope to be a part of that project if it actually happens. So we'd like to take a minute to acknowledge, uh, most importantly, Mr. Freising, Dr. Freisinger over there for helping kick our butts and <laughs> get, get all of our structure down, making sure that we, you know, after spring break, got it done, got it done. And another Mr. Kyle Snow over there for yeah. giving us so many, so many recommendations, helping us to transfer from our field test to our lab test and making the lab experience a lot more enjoyable. And we had a bunch more people involved with us, but overall we'd just like to thank you guys for listening. And uh, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. You focused uh, on standing water and ponds, and you mentioned the, the five to one, mm -hmm. one to five ratio. Uh, what would you predict if, uh, that these uh, a system like this in small streams, trout streams, where certainly you couldn't measure the chemical aspects mm -hmm. because the yeah. water's moving? But what, what would you predict the benefit would be? So, like we said earlier, uh, this material becomes a living filter. So anything passing through it microbes, you know, tiny little things, will get caught in that filter and just start multiplying. And then that will increase the efficiency of the nutrient uptake. And if there are plants, they will get on that material. They love it. They just get all over it. You could throw this material in a body of water and it will grow, start growing plants on it, even if you don't do anything with it. So they're actually, uh, Biohaven, I mean, Floating Islands International actually created a um, kind of stream bank, uh, designed for like small gutters because they actually, their farm out in Montana takes in water from a lot of the surrounding farmlands of CAFOs and you know, a lot of cattle farms out there and their nutrient inside the water levels are just astronomical. So they've actually been putting in these little buffer things that act as little V's and they allow some water to pass under but most of it passes right through. And, and so it actually would improve water clarity. They measured it, I think there's a case study on floating islands international it's a really good website to check out about all this stuff. Um, I hope to work with it in the future. But yeah, it definitely would improve suspended solids. That was the main one, because biofilm's sti sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Montana, mm -hmm. he told me to slap this little ball of uh, the matrix, and just tons of stuff just fell off of it. And I was like, wow, like, you don't realize how much is suspended mm -hmm. in the water and like how much is actually like suspended on that matrix. And, and another thing that we can kind of consider is like when they're remediating a, a buffer zone in a stream, for example, you have a lot of, you have to put in barriers in order for the erosion not to, you know, go into the stream causing, you know, um, a bunch more phosphorus and nitrogen and other nutrients to go down the stream. So these bio, this biohaven material kind of holds it all in there so it could be used as type of uh, remediation uh, like blocker for when they're doing shore remediation for you know streams in the local area instead of what you know they would use now um, like blocking big loads of soil and preventing them from running downstream yeah especially the fact that it's a living filter and not just a filter itself you never have to change it or replace it mm -hmm. and it'll always be renewing itself with the plant life that it comes through so it could absorb even like you said right on the side it would it would kind of structurally hold it in there and then and it would be built absorb in nutrients mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you do you think it could be um the biohaven material could be adapted for like a floating garden sort of thing where you could actually grow 
food crops on yes. it, or would it be? A hundred percent. Yeah. Do you think that um, the filter action would bring toxins into the food, though? Possibly. I feel like that very much depends on the water that you're going to mm -hmm. be set in. Um, maybe you need to do further remediation, and a lot of, I guess you're saying toxins as in harmful hazardous chemicals. Like petroleum or that, like that might not get as absorbed by the material because a lot of those heavy oils and toxic chemicals tend to sink to the bottom and become sources. So that was one issue that they did have at Floodlands International is that the nutrient reduction in the water would drop down to a point and then level off because at some point the plants are at maximum efficiency and it matches the nutrient load coming in to the water body itself. And you have, you yeah. have to harvest uh, the plants in order to take out the nutrients or it'll just go back into the water source. Another thing is that they were doing was, like he was saying, fishing. You, you would fish out all of the, the, the fish that were absorbing all the nutrients as well. So that's a big yeah. part of the, the whole ecosystem of this. Yeah. And fish absorb mm -hmm. toxins through their skin. So maybe you would just take them and then harvest them and put them in a concentrated area for a while until you realize that the toxin levels had dropped, which would take very long um, with this technology. But it really focuses on removing nutrient pollution in a short amount of time and suspended solids. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of this material and where is it produced? Um, it is produced all over the U.S. right now. Uh, they actually are an international company, so they actually started working with some New Zealander guys as well. So there's factories in New Zealand. I think there's three in America, one in the West Coast, one in the Midwest, and then one over here, I think in, uh, where is it, in Kansas, something like that. Um, our total, we had two 7.5 square foot islands, so a total of 15 square feet. Uh, mm -hmm. And that cost us about 520 bucks, mm -hmm. which I wish we had in our slides, I couldn't find it, but there is a cost breakdown analysis of this material uh, based on a pound of phosphorus per unit of time. And it shows that the matrix actually costs less up front than like installing a rain garden or putting in a wastewater treatment plant. It costs much less and you get your money back much faster because you also don't have to work on it as much. So I, I'll, I'll try to find that and get it to you because I know you. So. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, you can just keep using it, right? It doesn't. It would, mm -hmm. yeah. Does it degrade at all? Like the, the, the it, it is plastic? plastic, but once it's incorporated into the ecosystem, the plants are going to hold it all together. Also, UV rays are really the only thing that really breaks down plastic that we know of on a short term like lifespan of a human. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you put dirt on the top of it and you just kind of trim it up, because mm -hmm. my experience in Montana is that the corners tend to sink into the water a little bit more. Um, you just trim those off and then it looks more naturalized anyways. But once, like Brennan said, once the root systems get in there, it just takes over. You can't even tell that it's a floating island anymore. It's just a natural floating island. You have a question, Kyle? Yeah, so you guys have uh, talked up the biohaven material pretty well, and everybody seems on board. You know, it's the best stuff going. Are there any potential detriments to seeding plastic out into the natural environment? Uh, so if you notice on top of there, one layer is harder or one side is harder than the other side. That is a truck bed liner. And I was actually on the same board with you in Montana where it's like, but we're adding more plastic to the ecosystem. Is this that mm -hmm. great of an idea? And in the long term benefits, the island being installed improves the ecosystem so much better than if there's a little bit more plastic concentrated in one area. Mm -hmm. Because we did notice that the reason the truck bed liner is on there is that geese tend to try to fight and try to get in the seeds that go into the floating islands matrix and they'll tear it apart. So they put on a harder plastic armoring to prevent that, and it actually works very well so far. They actually found that geese was the most detrimental thing to the islands than anything else. Um, but I agree, I think there should be further testing on whether the plastic really degrades or not. And a lot of problems with the research we found here um, is that it's being done, and since it's an emerging private sector technology, most of the research is being done by the companies themselves because they don't have the money to outsource to other researchers. Um, it's also uh, so, it, it, we didn't want to put in too much biased research, but it is good research. It just seems to need a little financial stability to really get it in the mainstream. You talked about um, being able to keep these in indefinitely, but on the other hand, as you also pointed out, you're 
potentially removing uh, abiotic materials like uh, some of the, the soil particles that might be part of your total spent solids. And also you have plant materials that are eventually going to run through their life cycles mm -hmm. and die and decompose mm -hmm. and move nutrients back. So mm -hmm. it sounds like you probably do have to have a regular maintenance yeah, you have program to where you remove these things from the water body and remove the, the materials from it, obviously away from the source you're trying to protect. How, how often, you know, if I, I've got a, a pond that's about three quarters of an acre and it suffers from having a, a cattle pasture upstream from it. So if I, uh, certainly not going to cover it with one fifth. Yeah, and one fifth is like the idealistic. Right, Ten percent right. would be fine. Five percent. But, but if, how often do you or do they uh, recommend actually removing these islands and uh, basically clearing them and starting over again? So they have never had to clear one off. They focus more on. Um, at first, they started removing plant material, and it was just arduous work all the time. And he's an older dude; he's actually missing part of his leg, so it's it's really hard for him to get to do that. But he loves fishing, so he found that when you revitalize the ecosystem by purifying the water, natural systems become in place to balance everything out. So he started seeing more birds coming around and eating his fish and bringing them somewhere else and adding fertilizer to his garden. Um, and he was a very systems-minded kind of guy, so he found out a lot of that stuff was happening. He had some badgers move in, and you can say that that keeps a lot of nutrient in there. Um, but he... I'm pretty sure he pulled out about 7,000 pounds a year, a rough estimate that I can remember, of panfish. And he tried to focus on low body weight young fish, because he eventually wanted it to be a sporting pond, so he could have like big fish. So he was trying to keep some of the older, larger fish in there, um, and have us only take out the one to two year old fish that were about this size. But he took out a large density of them, just a lot of those fish. I remember just like standing there cutting fish for hours. Mm -hmm. so it was the, the thing is, we, yeah. we wouldn't know. A day, 7, a day of the year. Yeah, 7,000 fish, so that's not even yeah. pounds. But he, oh. he was also able, the panfish aren't that smart. So he was able to throw in a column net that his friend made him that was actually a very simple design and pull that out in the fall when it was too cold to fish all day. But he says pastime, if you catch 30 fish a day, um, because you can within probably about 15 minutes, the rate I was saying, um, you'll be fine. Eventually you will reach a nutrient goal. And the beautiful thing about the ecosystem is that it will balance itself out. Uh, a lot of times super quick change can cause well, detrimental What about the about material that accumulates in the matrix? Uh, are you speaking of... So, so soil, soil materials and stuff like that, that if this thing is working mm -hmm. because you have all this surface area of the, of the fibers in this matrix, this is eventually going to plug with, with soil particles and things like that. Mm -hmm. right? the, the, the purpose of the island is, is mostly for like remediation of an area. So if you want, uh, like for example, in our field test, we wanted the side of the, the actual lake itself to grow into where we had placed <coughs> the, the islands. So we don't really necessarily want to take them out. We want to have this riparian buffer nice and healthy growing mm -hmm. right up to the level of the islands in order for it to uh, be effective in taking up the nutrients itself. Um, but I, I understand that you know the, I, there are toxic things that can then attach to this thing, but I feel like most of it is, is about the actual, the plants being able to create a firm structure for it to, to attach to you know, a riparian buffer on the side of like a lake or, or the side of a stream or something like that. I think what Brendan's really getting at is the plants increase the surface area of the floating island, especially with all the tiny root hairs. Mm -hmm. So as it's growing and expanding, like I said, there's an island in Montana that I was able to step on, walk on, and cut trees off of. Um, that started about the size of two of these tables put together, grew to the size of this room. And that was still floating. They were still, you could swim under it, it was crazy. But it expanded because it started with that seed, and that's where the wetland seed kind of comes into play. So the surface area will increase as it grows. Um, there will be maximum limits reached, of course, once they reach the shore. And maybe at that point, it's just so overtaken by a swamp that you might have to move out. But I don't, I don't see that. <laughs> so, I mean, as long as you're managing it well, I think you find ways to remove what you need to remove, especially whenever you're transferring the nutrients through the ecosystem, the trophic web. Do you think there's a collateral benefit uh, where you these would serve as an environment for uh, beneficial uh, fauna, for instance, snails, salamanders, crayfish, uh, uh, 
worms, which then also would have a sort of a natural uh, uh, clearing of some of that material mm -hmm. to uh, maybe to address the doctors. Definitely, there. definitely creates habitats. Yeah. So um, one thing I noticed in Montana was that the root systems created great spawning areas and hiding holes for minnows uh, that the panfish mm -hmm. fed on, um, and the minnows fed on the paraphyton biofilm that was growing on uh, the islands themselves. Um, and that's also, I, I just realized another answer to your question, the minnows or organ in there will also eat the biofilm that's growing on there and transform it into their body mass and eventually die and you can take that out as well. But that's like a very small amount. Um, but you're specifically talking about habitat for these yeah. kinds of animals? Yeah, it, definitely. Um, especially if they are in shallower water mm -hmm. and they're able to really get in and nest up and mat up the, uh, the whole system. But it's very hard to predict what will come and what will, life always finds a way. <laughs> it's nefarious. <laughs> Any more questions? All right guys, thank you very much. Thank you.